welcome to our Ask Me Bite Size session. My name is Dr. Megan Brown. I'm a Senior Research Associate in Medical Education at Newcastle University, and I'm Ask Me's Director of Communications and Social Media, and I am the chair for today's session. The session will last about 45 minutes. If you wish to use a question, please just use the chat field. If you don't know, hopefully everybody uh, does know how to use Zoom by now. But if not, the feature is available by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Please make sure that you do select the option to post on the chat to panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your comment or question. Um, and if we don't get time to answer all questions, 45 minutes is, is quite tight. Um, we will provide a document after the webinar with any questions that we're unable to address and we'll send that to the panel. Um, the chat field's available for you to contribute to the conversation. We might invite some participants to expand on their comments by asking their permission to make their audio and, and video live. Um, please respond by the chat feed that you're happy for us to, um, to do that and to invite you to join the discussion if we, if we do ask for that. As you'll see, the session is being recorded and a video of this webinar will be made available on the ASME website, along with any other support materials that come from the session. Closed captions are available during the session if you um, would like those and can be managed by you as a participant by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. If you are having any technical problems, we ask that you uh, please make ASME aware by emailing events at asme.org.uk and we'll pop that email into the chat rather than adding it to the comments field. Um, so thank you very much for attending today. It's going to be a wonderful session. Um, as you'll see on screen, the title of the session is Choppy Waters, How Educators Can Support Their Learners to Navigate Healthcare Uncertainty. I'm really looking forward to the session. It is it's set to be super interesting. Um, and we have three panel members today. They'll introduce themselves in more details. Um, but in brief, we have Jenny Moffat, who's an educationalist based at RCSI. Um, who facilitates faculty development um, there at RCSA and who is Programme Director for the University's Postgraduate Diploma in Health Professions Education. Um, and Jenny is currently finishing a PhD with Utrecht University, exploring how health profession students can be supported to build uncertainty management strategies. Super relevant. Um, we also have Jason Hancock on the panel, who's a consultant liaison psychiatrist and director of medical education with Devon Partnership NHS Trust, and also an honorary clinical associate professor in med ed at the University of Exeter. And his research interests include doctor wellbeing and supporting doctors to develop more positive responses to clinical uncertainty. And last but not least, we have Jennifer Hammond, who's a professor of veterinary education and deputy head of the School of Biodiversity, One Health and Veterinary Medicine at the University of Glasgow. Um, Jenny's background is as a clinical teacher in small animal general practice at the university. And having developed an interest in veterinary education, assessment, curriculum design, she's been part of the school's working group to design and implement um, a new um, curriculum and has completed a professional doctorate in veterinary education. Jenny now leads the Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine and Surgery program and continues to develop her interest in educational research and scholarship relating to workplace learning, education for uncertainty, professional skills development and assessment. So that's a whistle-stop tour but I'll now hand over to the panel themselves to take you further into this bite-sized webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you, Asmi, for in allowing us to speak with you today. We're all really excited to be here. Um, 45 minutes is not a long time to talk about a very complex um, and really interesting topic. So I'm going to try um, and whiz through my bits as quickly as we can. So my name is Jason. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm based in Exeter. I'm also a clinical education researcher. And we're going to talk to you today about uncertainty um, in, in clinical medicine, but in broader fields as well. And um, Jennifer and Jenny will talk to you about that more shortly. So we're just going to very briefly, the three of us, talk you through some of our research before we open things up to um, to, to conversation, to a debate with you. If you have any comments or questions, please do put them in the chat as we're talking. We really want to, to hear those. Um, but firstly, before I dive in, can if you move on to the next slide, please, Jenny, I'm, I'm aware that there are a, a wide range of people here today. And I'd just like you to take a minute just to, to consider, just to think about yourselves. What, what do you understand by the term 
uncertainty. Now, if you're a clinician in whatever field that may be, have a think about what you might understand by the term clinical uncertainty. But if you're an educator, if you're working in other fields, what do you mean by the term uncertainty? And if you feel able to, then please do put put some words or a brief description of your your own definition in the chat. Don't put it, don't press enter yet. We'll ask you to press enter in a minute. I'm not going to look through all of those at the start because I think it's important that we move on. But if you feel able to, just to consider for a second, what do you mean by uncertainty? And if you could put that in the chat. And if you could put that in the chat, any any point from now, that would be that would be really, really great. But just for a minute or two, I'm going to talk about what I understand by uncertainty. There's no right or wrong answer, but this is the definition I would usually use and the definition I used to, to frame some of my research. So, Jenny, if you could move on to the next slide, please. And when I think about uncertainty, I'm... Oh, great. Perfect. Thanks, Jenny. When I'm talking about uncertainty, I'm usually, usually leaning quite heavily on Helen et al. Um, and the work of Paul Han and colleagues when thinking about uncertainty. So... When I mean when I talk about uncertainty, I mean the, the conscious awareness of ignorance about a particular aspect of the world. So clinically, that will mean that I'm often making a decision, be that diagnosis, be that a management plan, um, where I am aware that I, the outcome of this clinical decision, I, I do not know what that will be. And that that uncertainty can be caused by a, a range of different things. So that might be caused by probability. And my interpretation of this definition would be a situation where we perhaps have quite a lot of published clinical evidence about the likelihood of outcomes in certain scenarios, whether that's prescribing statins and the numbers needed to treat to prescribe statins to result in a reduced cholesterol for, to, for population, um, or prescribing antipsychotics in the context of behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia. There's quite a lot of evidence that suggests how likely certain outcomes are, but when I'm making the prescribing decision for this individual patient, I don't know what the outcome is going to be for this individual patient. So there is uncertainty caused by probability. There's also ambiguity as a source of uncertainty, and that's when there is imprecise, missing or conflicting information. And my interpretation of this definition would be, I guess, an example where perhaps imagine you're a junior clinician. It's the middle of the night. You're a junior doctor in this scenario. You're being asked to, to clerk in a new unwell patient who has diabetes, and therefore you need to prescribe their insulin in order to manage their diabetes. If you don't prescribe it, they're going to get unwell. If you prescribe it incorrectly, they could well become unwell as well. But there might be missing information. The patient might not be able to tell you what their usual dose of insulin is. There might be imprecise information. The patient might have dementia or might have an acute confusion or state or delirium and they can't give you accurate information about that. Or there might be conflicting information where the patient tells you one thing, the GP records, the electronic notes tell you a different thing, the collateral history from the relative tell you a different thing. But you still need to make a decision in the middle of the night in the context of uncertainty caused by ambiguity. And finally, just to extend that example further, to think about complexity. So complexity may be the same, the same scenario, but in addition, the patient now has a new condition. So they might have a new infection or a new sepsis, and that individual's insulin requirement has changed in a perhaps unpredictable way, causing uncertainty into how much insulin you should prescribe. But you still need to make that decision, and you still need to prescribe that insulin. Jenny, if you could move on to the next slide. I'm hoping that I or any of us don't need to spend a long time talking to you about why uncertainty is important and how prevalent it is within the practice of, for myself, medicine, but also um, you know, many, many other fields. And it's clear that students and those students that we support and those that we um, to support with their training need to develop an ability to work with or work in scenarios where there are there is clinical uncertainty. Um, some examples of the types of competence frameworks that exist in medicine to, to set out what's expected here would be the GMC Outcomes for Graduates in 2018. They talk about the need for newly qualified doctors to recognise complexity and uncertainty and to work in clinical scenarios where there is uncertainty and complexity. And if you look at the CanMeds competency frameworks for Canadian physicians, uncertainty is mentioned at multiple points. Um, with different levels of competence and response from clinicians expected at different levels of seniority, but they're present within those frameworks. Jenny, if you can move on to the next slide. One of the things that's becoming clear is that the way we respond to uncertainty or ambiguity as clinicians has an impact on, um, I guess, our own outcomes, 
patient outcomes and patient related outcomes and it's becoming clear across the board that more positive responses to ambiguity or uncertainty are more likely to be associated with positive clinician but also positive patient outcomes and I'm not going to talk in a lot of detail about um, this aspect of my research but I think it's important to mention that one of those those outcomes that I've become increasingly interested in is the the prevalence or the incidence of psychological well-being in individual clinicians so for example does the way that we as as a clinician, as a doctor, the way that we respond to ambiguity or uncertainty, does it influence our own um, likelihood of developing reduced psychological well-being? So one of the papers, one of the things that I've worked on as part of my PhD, looked at this in the literature. And this is a, a summary of a conceptual model that we started to develop following a systematic review, which demonstrated that having less good or intolerance to ambiguity or uncertainty was more likely to be associated with increased levels of stress burnout and mental health disorders within the clinician as the doctor or the medical student. Jenny, if you could move on to the next slide. Now, this is a bit of a shameless plug, um, but I think it's in, uh, rather than me talking about this here, I've become increasingly interested in this research. And one of the things that I'm investigating this in at the moment is in a population of newly qualified doctors. So, for example, those doctors um, that progress to interim F1s and F1s during the COVID pandemic. And one of the things that I'm researching at the moment is investigating in that population, does, does a doctor's response to ambiguity or uncertainty, is it, is it associated with their likelihood of developing stress, burnout, or mental health disorders? And what might be the individual moderators of that, that person? And more importantly, what might be the wider contextual or workplace factors that might influence that relationship for individuals? And, and last week, the NHS Practitioner Health team and the Wounded Healer podcast published this um, this interview where I talk about this in a bit more detail and that current research. If we can move on to the next slide, bring us back to today's talk about how we as educators can support our, our colleagues, our students, our supervisees to develop more positive responses to uncertainty. And this is going to be the focus of our conversation going forwards. This slide summarises an excellent paper by Priya Patel, who was a medical student at the time completing a master's dissertation that I, that I supervised. And she looked at interventions that had been developed and tried in medical students to help those students develop more positive responses to uncertainty. And this was a scoping review published in Medical Education. Now, if you just focus on the, the box in the middle, as you can see, many different things have been tried in medical students to support them to develop more positive responses to uncertainty and the papers podcast I think described this set of interventions as a kitchen sink of interventions there's everything in there there's PBL based curriculum changes simulation scenarios which involve creating deliberately ambiguous scenarios and asking students to complete them changing the assessment framework introducing medical students to medical humanities um, but actually the thing that made the biggest difference looking across all of these interventions was not necessarily the intervention but the environment in which that intervention was delivered for students, the, the students being supported by their supervisors um, and being provided with a psychologically safe space to reflect on their own responses to these in interventions, to understand and bring into their conscious awareness their own responses to ambiguity and uncertainty and support them to think about their responses and think about strategies that they could use in the future when in encountering similar um, problems and similar similar scenarios. And I think this will probably lead us on to some of the conversations we're going to have outside of medicine and to other places. So I'm, I'm going to, to stop there. I'm going to hand over to Jennifer Hammond, who will introduce herself and talk a little bit about her work. Thanks very much, Jason. And um, it was really interesting to, to hear about your research, which was a, a big uh, inspiration for, for me getting involved in this area as well. Um, so my name is Jennifer Hammond and as Jason alluded to, I come from a different area of health professions education. So I'm a veterinarian by trade. Um, however, as Jason's highlighted, we have a lot in common across the health professions uh, in that we all need to be comfortable or at least capable of managing uncertainty in clinical and wider professional practice. Um, so the slide that's on the screen just now is equivalent to the one that Jason put up about CANMEDS. Um, and this shows the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons day one competencies, which have, have changed a little bit over the years, but essentially it is 
considered essential that day one newly graduated vets are able to cope with uncertainty and ambiguity um, and that's something that they will all face in, in their daily work. Um, and I was initially drawn to this topic of uncertainty through my clinical role. So I worked in a charity practice supporting undergraduate learners. Uh, it was quite a resource limited setting. And I noticed it was very interesting, different students responded in different ways to perhaps being faced with incomplete information, maybe an ambiguous situation, one where they didn't have all the test results they might normally expect to have, or sometimes very complex situations. Um, and I was just really interested in how, how students differed in their approaches, but also how we might support students to become um, capable of, of dealing with these situations. So as Megan said at the start, I did a doctorate in health professions education. And as part of that, um, Jenny, if you could move on to the next slide. I looked at how um, students, veterinary students in particular, learn to cope with uncertainty in practice. Um, and I was interested in um, both our current training approaches uh, and also whether there were some examples of good practice that we might be able to build on. Um, Next slide, please, Jenny, it would be great. Thank you. So one aspect of my research involved adapting Jason's TAMSAD scale for use with veterinary undergraduate students. It didn't need a lot of adaptation, but some of the, the questions did need to be adapted. And, and I went through a process of validating the scale for use for veterinary learners. Uh, and then I started looking at how ambiguity tolerance changed during the course of veterinary training. Um, and this has been a really interesting area of research and has since then we've also completed some comparative work comparing veterinary and medical learners. Um, and also uh, you, several teams have used the scale to evaluate different educational interventions. So I think that's been one, one area that has been of interest and continues to develop. Um, but I think one of the more interesting aspects of my doctorate and the area that I think probably helped most was looking at an example of potentially good practice. So I did a qualitative study looking at how learners navigate uncertainty in a workplace based learning setting. Um, and this photo shows some of our students on an international elective placement where our students work with working equid populations. Um, it was a really interesting study uh, and I'm not going to go into detail, but essentially it showed just how important actually taking some sort of case ownership was for giving students opportunities to engage with uncertainty. Um, and I'm going to give you on the, the next slide, if we move on, just one example of the sorts of uncertainty that our learners were beginning to navigate. So this was a quote from one of the participants um, and I'm just going to leave it up for a moment to allow you to have a read through. So I think this example pulls in probably all of the elements that Jason talked about at the beginning um, in terms of the areas that may provoke uncertainty and highlighted to us really that our learners are encountering uncertain situations. Um, but critically, and as Jason has already alluded to, it is about how we support them with those encounters that is important. Um, so the support from supervisors and the conversations with teams as part of that workplace learning were one of the really critical areas that were important for our learners um, becoming more comfortable in navigating uncertainty. If we could move on to the next slide. Um, so I'm now programme director for the veterinary programme at Glasgow, and we've had a relatively recent curriculum redesign and we've used this opportunity to think about how research in this area might develop our approaches. So um, one of the conversations we've started locally is with the clinical teachers and looking at our clinical learning environments. 
setting up structures that enable um, the creation of psychologically safe spaces, having enough time for students to work with teams for periods of time and build up trust, um, and encouraging uh, uh, sharing of uncertainty within those groups and teams. Um, similarly, if we move on to the final of my slides, um, valuing reflection um, as a way to encourage students to focus on uncertainties. Um, and we've used a reflective portfolio to perhaps get away at least partly from this single correct answer approach to assessment that can um, create some false um, understanding around the, the nature of, of clinical work. So that's a little bit of my experience. I'm going to pass you on to Jenny, who'll tell you about her research now. I just I noticed actually a bit of a pattern there. So um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Jenny Moffat and I'm a faculty developer and educationist based at RCSI. That's the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And uh, um, Jason inspired Jenny in her doctoral work and Jenny inspired me in my doctoral work. So if your name begins with J or starts with a J and you're looking for a PhD topic, uncertainty might be the one for you just to keep uh, passing the, 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 the baton on. And um, so one of the key things, I, you know, again, I just became very interested in uncertainty and how um, healthcare students uh, manage uncertainty and learn around uncertainty. So in the course of my doctoral work, uh, one of the first things I wanted to do was to establish what we knew with respect to the literature around how undergraduate health professions students learn to engage with uncertainty. Um, and then from there, uh, moved into using a, a recognised taxonomy of uncertainty uh, by uh, Paul Han and colleagues. And I believe, Paul, you might be on the call there today. So a little, little wave and a thank you for that. Um, before then moving into a design-based re research approach where we developed an educational escape room, an online educational escape room, where we would create a learning environment where our students would engage um, with um, cognitive and affective experiences around uncertainty. So just to tell you a little bit about uh, the findings from each of those studies, first of all, with the scoping review, I think one of the, the clearest things that came out of that was that our students, um, and this is across the professions, we had medical students, um, dentistry students, veterinary students, uh, physiotherapy, pharmacy. So our students, our undergraduates, are meeting uncertainty um, everywhere uh, in their educational journey when they begin to um, engage with academic practice. And they were meeting it in particular spaces, oftentimes at transitions, oftentimes around evaluations and assessments. And one of the key things that we were learning is that whilst our healthcare students are meeting uncertainty and a lot of professional frameworks, as Jason has pointed out, is expecting um, curricula to prepare their students for uncertainty. Um, oftentimes there wasn't a lot of evidence about how exactly to do that and what were uh, the recognised ways to do that. Um, so I'll just move on a slide there. And I apologise, there's a little bit of building work going on at the moment, so if you hear a bit of uh, thudding in the background, it's not uh, anything doom laden, just the, the nearby building site. Um, so really in the literature, there is uh, scarce evidence of structured curricular interventions that help support learning around uncertainty. Um, there were some kind of sporadic uh, studies that looked at arts uh, and simulation based learning initiatives. Uh, and also we recognised that um, there was a negative narrative around uncertainty. So this is the idea that when uncertainty comes up as a topic for discussion, it's often very much interlinked with feelings of stress and anxiety for the students. And again, um, you know, if we understand uncertainty as a phenomenon that's around us, it, it, it is in itself a neutral phenomenon. And actually there are ways that we can harness uncertainty uh, as a driver or a catalyst for learning. But um, if we look at the evidence around how students experience it, it tends to be a little bit of a knee jerk into stress and anxiety. What the scope review also highlighted that there are natural homes for uncertainty training. So it's not necessarily that we reinvent the wheel around it, but perhaps look at domains such as professionalism, interprofessional education, 
uh, ethics, communication skills and evidence based medicine, as I can see is coming up in the comments here, are all places where um, you would have kind of it's natural bedfellows for um, uncertainty uh, training. So with, with the scoping review wrapped up, uh, one of the elements I was really interested in was that idea of simulation based learning and how we could use simulation based learning uh, to support learning around uncertainty. And uh, this kind of coincided with a time where uh, we had a you know, global pandemic and a lot of things moved online. And at the time, I just thought, you know, how do I make my teaching more engaging? Um, is there a way that I could harness simulation based learning to um, use this? Uh, and could we uh, try to trigger an experience of uncertainty, but in a playful manner in such a way that our students could engage with uncertainty um, and then debrief around that. So what that meant, uh, we did get uh, funding and very fortunate to get funding from the Medical Council of Ireland and the Irish Network of Healthcare Educators and also internal funding from RCSI, our Student Engagement and Partnership Project. And so uh, a team of staff and students came together to create an online escape game, uh, which we uh, submitted um, to a, a couple of rounds of play testing and studies and so um, what the game was was small group we had teams of between four and six students engage with this online puzzle game and um, in the uh, domains the different puzzles that we uh, used were actually aligned again with that taxonomy of uncertainty so the students would engage with probability ambiguity and complexity and um, hopefully have some fun along the way and then when they come out at the other end we debrief around that now what we've learned um, from several rounds of play testing and now uh, we've rolled it out within the curriculum so um, there's about 400 students at RCSI uh, that have had access to this game and uh, we're just in the thick of uh, rolling it out at the moment. Um, the findings from this is, is that game based learning can actually be a really effective space to stimulate emotional and cognitive processes so when it comes to uncertainty yes we want them to engage in reflection and thinking um, and decision making and problem solving but actually um, it can be argued that we want them to feel that emotional experience as well because if they naturally tend towards stress and anxiety all of the time, it can mean that those higher order thinking skills and problem solving skills can be harder to reach. So we want to introduce them to the idea that uncertainty can be um, emotion provoking. The other aspect that we found was really useful with this approach was it was highlighting um, that uncertainty is it's a team sport. It's really something um, that a group, uh, a hive mind can approach together rather than somebody trying to um, tackle it or navigate it on their own. And also uh, by sharing those uncertainty experiences, what that does is it highlights uh, nuances of mindsets, approaches and impacts. And, you know, a, a really typical example of that uh, last week when we rolled it out with the group um, and, and I'm uh, I, I'm a little bit of a voyeur. So they're playing it in teams. They're in their separate breakout rooms. I'm not in the room with them, but I can see in the chat channel the conversation that's going on, the to and fro's, the dialogue. And you can really see um, the expression of emotion and they're like, oh man, I'm so stuck. I don't know what to do. Uh, how do we how do we tackle this one? And then somebody will come up with an idea and then suddenly the channel is full of, whoa, that's great. Wow, I didn't see that, uh, you know, so they really jump in and it's giving this sense that whenever you approach a puzzle together, different people will see different things. And so those different uh, perspectives can really help to unblock and move you forward with the puzzle. Um, so with that in mind, and actually, let me just go back to that one for a second. What I will say is the debriefing is really critical. So we've used the escape game and um, they enjoy the game, they enjoy the puzzles. But what we need to do in the debriefing is to take what they've experienced in the game and translate that out to the wider practice. And we go in and we talk to the learners about their uncertainties and um, specifically with their uncertainties and moving from preclinical to clinical training. Um, and we also use the game to highlight that uncertainty. Yes, there can be um, unpleasant emotions around it. You know, you can feel a little bit uh, frustrated. You can feel confused at times. You can feel overwhelmed. Um, we do have a race against the clock strategy so they can feel the pressure. But we also 
go back and look at you know what was what other feelings were there excitement curiosity curiosity and um, interest um, a sense of satisfaction when a puzzle was unlocked so just understanding that if we can add a little bit of space uh, uh, more mindfulness around uncertainty so that we don't automatically go down the route of feeling stress and anxiety that we can step back and say ah there's a puzzle in front of me this is this is a puzzle rather than a problem um, and how can i tackle this so also seeing that ability to be able to share with each other as well that shared reflection and at times when you don't feel comfortable sharing the uncertainty is to use individual reflection. And I talked to the students about journaling and e-journaling and different routes where you can actually try to harness the experience, uh, turn it into language. Uh, they can use audio diaries or um, kind of record themselves on their phones as well. By turning those uncertain experiences um, into a more language based um, or text based uh, experience it can diffuse some of the emotions and help them to move through or sit with an uncertainty so i realized now i've talked a lot there and uh you know the three of us I, we could talk for days on our research so we were uh we tried to keep it down to the bare minimum today but we would like to hear from you guys as well and i do have a question for the group and that is you know i've talked a few about a few of the strategies there that we've shared with our medical students and uh, what uncertainty management strategies uh, do you currently use? Now, I realize we have a, a, a team decision here to make uh, whether to use breakout rooms or go for a general um, use of the chat box here. What do we think? Let's use our hive mind here. I'm reflecting on my uncertainty with you. <laughs> how many people have we got on, Jenny? Do you know how many? We're 41 we've got? at the moment. We 41 and 10 minutes, so I'm kind of, because we've had, it looks like we've had a very active chat yeah. uh, group here. I might be a bit inclined to stay in the big, in the big room. What do we think? I would agree, I think, yeah. yeah. I'm seeing Megan nod as well. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Jason's on board, yeah, fantastic. I, I haven't used half enough ship analogies, sea and ship analogies today. So what I'm going to do is put into the chat box, we have a Padlet page, and I would really love to see um, your thoughts, your additions around this. So what are the uncertainty strategies uh, that you're currently using? And similarly, if you want to put it into the chat box or on mute and tell us about that, that would be wonderful as well. Thank you, Anna. That's brilliant. So gathering information, sharing uncertainty, asking for help. Yeah, brilliant. I can see the little activities at the beginning there. So, so I can see a comment coming into the chat just talking about um. Sorry, I'm going to try and see at the bottom here. Instead of trying to resolve uncertainty, becoming comfortable with that. Um, I guess we haven't talked about the difference between tolerance of uncertainty, navigating uncertainty. We've deliberately used the word navigating rather than tolerance in the the title today. And here, the ability to ask for help to support you navigating that, making informed decisions. Just on the Padlet board there, so um, from a paediatric emergency department, shared decision making uh, with both learners and then family is important and trying to engage learners in the thought process. So yeah, that's one of the recognised strategies from the literature is, is think out loud, a think out loud protocol. So where you talk to the learners and actively let them know what's going on in your brain and um, you know my thoughts on this are or I'm, I'm you know I'm drawn between these two options myself or I'm currently trying to think about the appropriate diagnostics here and um, also in the padlet there I, I really like this one so I think step one is acknowledging it is there and naming the beast that is absolutely true and um, naming it saying it out loud and um, recognizing it's uncertainty so talking to the students you, your, your first um, awareness of uncertainty might be a feeling of stress and anxiety, but if you step back and look at what's going on, then you might notice it's actually an uncertainty that's the phenomenon that you're dealing with, rather than straight away going into that stress. Uh, Jenny, I can see people talking about intellectual candor there as well. Yes. Yeah, do you want Sorry, to... I'm just jumping in because I saw yeah. a comment in the chat as well that kind of links to that. and the. the the importance of, and I say this as a supervisor as well, the importance of role modelling 
a kind of it being okay to not know and okay to sit with that uncertainty you know sharing some of your vulnerability if you feel comfortable with that and it feels appropriate with your students and your learners which seems to be similar comments coming up in the chat and on the on the padlet mm. so this is a really good example of complexity uh, in the taxonomy so we've got two streams of uh, uh, ideas coming in here so um, and I like this one as well consider uncertainty as the true state and see certainty in almost anything as an illusion that's very deep I like that <laughs> it's a really interesting question coming on the chat is do we encourage learners to share their uncertainty with clients or patients um, I think that's a really interesting aspect to this isn't it as well as intellectual candor within the team and with learners and, and uh, supervisors. Um, but sometimes that sharing of uncertainty with clients and patients, I, I, I think that's really fascinating whether we, whether we encourage that um, with our learners enough. I think it, it is a key skill because, you know, veterinary clients and uh, human patients do crave certainty. It's human nature to want to have certainty about the trajectory of a condition um, you know the outcomes the possible prognosis so i think it's very human to crave certainty and it's up to us as health professionals to have the skills to be able to help them in that journey so it's about being authentic and honest and um, but hitting the right tone and i think that's a really um that's an expert skill and i do think our students need to learn it but they would need appropriate scaffolding around that and i would suggest that learning to share uncertainty within that more, as you say, uh, Jenny, more psychologically safe environment within the small groups, within the uh, teaching and learning, that, that's the first crucial space. Um, but moving into the client domain or the patient domain, yes, it's absolutely necessary, but we probably need more support, I would say. Mm. Yeah, and a really interesting follow up sort of on the chat about um there being a real balance between the vulnerability of saying, I don't know, but maintaining that credibility. And I think that's a balance yeah. we all strike day to day, isn't it? Um, in a lot of interactions. It's a big thing that comes out in the literature as well, is this idea of impression management. So um, medical students and junior doctors will engage in, you know, they have to do the work, but they're also carrying out another more, um, I would say kind of hidden task and that is trying to project that they are comfortable and confident and in control so even when they're feeling uncertain about something they really don't want to to show that and that's you know recognized across different professions and um, again quite a human um, aspect but it's really critical that we create cultures and teams that support psychological safety in that our learners and our well our, our, our professionals feel safe to say you know what i'm really not sure about this and that they don't have to project that om omnipotent knowing everything um surface facade mm -hmm. I see, hello, Carol, lovely to see you. Uh, I can see your hot topic there in veterinary healthcare is the gold standard versus contextualized care. Uh, using shared decision-making contextualized care approach almost uh, requires, I'd say that's almost always requires navigation of uncertainty. Absolutely, yeah, I think that's a really key uh, place for it. And I think this leads back to Jenny, your slide about all of those uncertainties that the student was facing. I think in veterinary medicine, it's almost, you know, it's so unique in that uh you know I, I do remember times myself as a new graduate out on a farm without access to the tests um working with the financial limitations of the client in front of you rain coming down you know there's just so much uncertainty uh, that you just have to kind of to roll with on those different layers and um, so yeah i think that the financial considerations um, and the patient perspective the client perspective is hugely important Uh, Jenny, just to say, um, I, I think it's one of the things that's been really great, particularly, I guess, with working with the two of you o over the years as well in these ways, is having this cross-professional kind of opportunity to think between medicine and, and veterinary medicine. And I, it's something I I think we don't do enough of. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. And certainly the way you talk about the way you, know, you experience uncertainty. I think a lot of doctors 
might kind of forget how how much uncertainty is inherent within other you know clinical roles but also outside of that you know uncertainty is everywhere and I think we often forget there's a lot we can learn from other professions when trying to think about this. Really interesting questions coming on the chat so do we need to consider how we assess students to take into account the uncertainty in medical practice? I, I This really interests me because I think you know, the, the assessment approaches that have a single best answer, multiple choice question, for example, are, are setting an expectation that may or may not be realistic. Um, I'd be really interested to hear others' thoughts on that idea of assessment, because I think it's really critical. Yeah, there's a the, there's the whole argument that the more structured and organised we become, in education, you know, it's, it's so linear. We have constructive alignment, we have learning outcomes, we have checklists, we have PowerPoints, we have, you know, um, everything's very clean and clear and organized. And then we go out into practice and it's not quite as organized as that. So there is a big debate um, within the uncertainty literature about what type of uncertainties. Uh, I, I, um, there's an author, Baghetto, refers to productive uncertainty and unproductive uncertainty. So it's probably not productive uncertainty to send your learners to a room on the other side of campus for a tutorial and then move it at the last minute. That's maybe not the, the sort of uncertainty you want to expose them to. Whereas the uncertainty of meeting patients from a different cultural background with perhaps language barriers, that is a productive certainty because, you know, it's um, asking the learner to step into a practice that is um, really aligned with the work, the, the uncertainty work that they're going to meet. Um, and, and Jenny, I don't know, um, I think uncertainty work is such a useful term. Uh, I don't know, if, would you want to, do you want to just describe that a little bit? Yeah, I, it came from some of the qualitative work I did. And I, I suppose what I wanted to try and do is get a term that captured the the engagement with uncertainty, the navigation of uncertainty that happens in professional practice. Um, and I liked, I, I have heard of the concept of emotional labor as something that people mm. talk about, that, you know, people taking on emotional labor. And, and in a way, what I could see within the professional workplaces that our students were involved is that there was this uncertainty work. And actually, interestingly, they didn't always get access to it. Mm. So it was quite a privileged thing within the community to actually have a full sharing, um, have somebody be vulnerable with you and share their uncertainties in some situations. Um, and I thought that was really interesting, uh, this idea that our professionals have uncertainty work as part of their role, um, but whether we were always exposing undergraduates to that in a productive way prior to them taking on that kind of professional mantle. That would be a, my, my best description of, it, it was a term that I found useful to describe what I was seeing within those workplace settings. And I thought what I really like about that is it makes it tangible. It makes it something that you can, you know, see in the relationship between a tutor and tutees or a mentor and mentees. Um, it, it, it puts a, a language around some of the expectations that are there. Um, brilliant. I, I realise we're coming up to our, our time. Um, so I believe uh, myself and Jenny and Jason, we can stay on a little bit longer. If anybody has any questions or things that they want to discuss, uh, we'd be more than delighted to stay on. Uh, well, Jenny, in the meantime, I, oh, just to say, I just so while I'm on that theme, just because I've noticed there were some really difficult and thorny questions in the chat that I'm we are not going to duck out of if people put the most difficult question they can think of in there that's fine we will yeah. if we don't get to it today we'll commit to thinking about this and responding in yeah. a document so please do put those questions in there if we haven't answered those yet sorry Jenny well yeah no well, and, and we can endeavour to have a, have a go at them today as well um, for those of you that do have to um, go off we have a, another Padlet, I'm a bit addicted to Padlet, we have another Padlet with uh, resources uh, that might be of useful, another shameless plug for Jason's podcast. <laughs> and we have some nice feature articles, uh, research articles, and uh, if you use that QR code there, it should bring you directly to the Padlet, uh, otherwise we can send the link to you afterwards as well.
Great. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you to the to the panelists, to Jason, Jenny and Jennifer. And thank you for everyone who's, who's shown up today. It's, it's amazing to see so many people um, here. And I think the the depth and the thoughtfulness of the questions in in the chat are a real testament to the to the quality of today's bite size and to the to the interest and the engagement in this topic, which is just wonderful to see. So thank you. I have put some further details in the chat in terms of a video of this session will be available on the ASME website in a few days. Um, and if you enjoyed this bite size, this is a, a series of events. Um, we have some slightly longer, what we're calling megabyte sessions. Um, and we have the, actually the first one of those, which will be held on Tuesday, the 30th of April from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Um, and that's on the barriers, opportunities and enablers associated with engaging allied health professionals in clinical education research. So I've just put the link in the chat if you'd like some more information. But thank you so much. I will leave this open that if people want to stay on and chat to the panel, um, you can. Um, but if you do need to get away, thank you again for attending today. And we're down to, to 16. I think that's probably about 13 people left. There's a lot of questions here, aren't there? There is, yeah. Um, this one here, what's the balance between teaching specific strategies versus an overall development of metacognitive... What a great question. <laughs> overall development of metacognitive competencies. That's almost like an existentialist question uh, for education in general. I think it's a bit of both. Yeah, I think it's useful to have strategies, but the metacognitive bit, I suppose, is around uh, being able to reflect on those strategies and when and how they, each one is most appropriately <laughs> employed. Um, so, yeah, I, I, when I reflect on it, I think there are, there are certainly strategies that can be described and can be very helpful, mm -hmm. but it's not always clear when each strategy is best employed, and I think that's the part where the metacognition comes in. Perhaps that would be one way I would look at it. Yeah. Really good question. I think the specific strategies are useful to make sure that something like this doesn't get lost in the lost in professional development, all of those competencies. You know, um, I think it could be a possibility that uncertainty might just get rolled in and isn't given the time and the space that it needs and by using specific teaching strategies I, I think just for example with, with the escape game it's very much aligned with those feelings of surprise puzzlement confusion and um, so I think what it does is it just keeps uncertainty it gives it foregrounds it because otherwise it could get lost in a sea of learning outcomes that, that would be my take on it I don't know if Jason if you had any thoughts on that I'm sorry I've been flicking through so many of the other questions and trying to work out what on earth to say about some of them um, I, do, I do realize there's a few for those of you that have staying on the call um would anybody like to unmute and, and ask us a question uh, if you've stuck around you may have a burning question which we'd be delighted to look at for you Hi everyone. I just thought I'd uh, chip in because that was my question. Is it your question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, Jay, I know uh, Jason supervised my master's, which is also about uncertainty and um, evidence-based medicine, particularly. You've got Jay's name I, as well. I know. Well, I thought is, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it allowed? To, are you allowed to have it as a, as a surname? <laughs> is that okay? <laughs> um, yeah. It was just as I was listening, and, and it's something I've obviously wrestled with a little bit. Is that there is this tension, isn't there, between a lot of what we say about uncertainty is how resilient you are, how you're able to deal with it kind of emotionally, how your own self-awareness and comfort with that feeling of uncertainty, which strikes me as quite a complex thing um, that to develop as a professional, but, but really important, versus, as you were saying, Jenny, not, not losing that in amongst the sort of sea of things and being able to say, well, look, actually, there are some times when I, you know, like you said, you know, maybe I'm in a setting where, I found something really difficult, I'm feeling uncertain and I want to then bring it to reflect with colleagues and that's a specific strategy and that's really helpful. But the two kind of interplay and I and I kind of think it's really, it's sort of, it's kind of, there's definitely space for both and I think it's essential to uh, kind of link the two, the two things together. Because um, my state of uncertainty definitely fluctuates according to 
how I'm doing and how I've slept the night before and all that yeah, sort of stuff. And that, and, and, yeah, but then I also good. want something like some of the stuff I teach around EBM, which I think are quite important single skills around explaining risk and communicating. So it's kind of where I'm at with it. I think one of the most exciting things about uncertainty research is that it has come from a place where it was very much seen as a personality, a combination of personality traits and that it was quite stable and at a fixed point. But I think what, uh, you know, and Jason, your scope review uh, lends to this very nicely. We are understanding now that there are strategies you can build. It is, it is a, a, a growable skill it is it is mutable it's amenable to training so you can develop uncertainty skills but i will say um uncertainty management it can be very context specific as well so it depends on you know where you're meeting the uncertainty and under what circumstances when it comes to personal uncertainty you're absolutely right it's, it's like typical maslow's hierarchy of needs you need to have those physiological things in place to sleep well to uh, eat well to get the exercise you know again just to be able to um optimize your personal approach to it but understanding that it's not it's not all on our personality it's not all on our you know um kind of us as an individual and that even when we're feeling in a place where we're quite vulnerable and um feel that we're not managing uncertainty that there are tools that we can reach for that can help us and um, jason i don't know what's your thoughts on that yeah, I mean, there are lots of thoughts, aren't there? I think um, the two things that come to mind when hearing Edmund talk and, and all of this is, is not losing sight of the benefit of feeling the uncertainty. You know, I think Ilgen talks a lot about the kind of alarm bell. Like it's a feeling uncomfortable when there's uncertainty is often quite an appropriate and really positive response because it's really important to be aware that you're in a situation that's new and novel and you don't quite have the skills to manage it and you need to look to your supervisors or seniors. So not losing sight in all of this that, there's a role for that. Um, but I think you might also, I think it's really important that we move away from the static, you know, trait as a personality, um, you know, based thing that's quite stable. There were all sorts of implications for not moving away from that. You know, I think we talked about assessment earlier and I thought we were gonna go down a, should we be assessing people at the point of entry to medical school to make sure they're tolerant enough of ambiguity or uncertainty before they can come into medical school, which I'd be really, really worried about moving towards that situation you know i think there's a medicine is a broad church it needs people with a whole range of different experiences um, and backgrounds and um yeah kind of and, and, and needs that i don't think we should be setting those thresholds but i think also move uh, remembering we all exist in a context don't we we and i feel very uncomfortable whenever we talk about the individual needing to be more resilient um you know, or the individual needing to develop their own better responses to uncertainty. I think we need to think about how can the environment better support people to have more positive responses to uncertainty, or how can the environment better support people who do have a lower level of tolerance to uncertainty to make sure they don't develop negative psychological consequences to that. Yeah, this, this came up, we had an amazing talk here in our CSI last week, uh, a lady called Mary Doherty, who's an autistic doctor, and she would say that tolerance for uncertainty um, although she didn't express it in those terms, but you know, uncertainty is something that can be problematic for uh, neurodiverse individuals. So, you know, and with that uh, in mind, that whole idea of culture change and what we can do to support individuals that just need a little bit of extra guidance and signposting, um, doctors and patients. So, you know, I think that's a whole interesting um, angle on it too, and how we need to. Again, I, I think you're right. I think a lot of it comes down to this idea of how do we make the environment safer for overt, authentic conversations around uncertainty to, to exteriorize those personal uncertainties, bring them out into the light. Can I bring Viv in, who I see has got a hand up? Come in, please. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I teach everyone that medicine's quite grey. It's not black and white, and I teach that to the, the patients um, as well as the students that I, I see, particularly if they've gone off on the wrong track on something as per the, the, the task in front of them. If they've got reasons that they can explain why they've gone off on that track, I'm quite happy. If they've just picked something they knew about, uh, that's tough. Um, but most, a lot of people I think that do medicine, 
including myself, like a challenge of solving problems, which is why I think your games work. And yeah. by definition, if you like solving problems, particularly ones that other people can't do, that is uncertainty that you accomplish yourself and you give yourself the feedback because medicine as a profession is very right, wrong and only says something to you when you've got it wrong and then doesn't explain why you've got it wrong, let alone getting good feedback. Uh, and I, I'm really pleased to see how curriculum and teaching is, is changing. Uh, Newcastle was always quite ahead of the curve, but they're reinventing themselves every decade or so. And it, it does seem to make a, not does seem to, it, it it's, has made a difference to the relationship we can have with the students in an educational sense uh, by just people being able to put cards on the table and go, hmm, I don't know that, but where would I look it up? And then you can look it up yourself. <laughs> so I just wanted to add that being someone that was neurodiverse and it wasn't picked up actually till I got to med school. So Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, neurodiversity, the, the, the figures are staggering for the amount of people that fall into that category and it's only now that we're starting to really um, honor that and celebrate it as well because you know I, I just think it's so important like you say jason uh, medicine's a broad church we need to be able to provide services that actually um meet the needs of diverse patients and you know the research shows that for neurodiverse patients they they communicate so much more easily and more freely with neurodiverse professionals so um Yes, so thank you so, so much for uh, sharing that, Viv. Uh, and the other thing with neurodiverse, um, quite quite a few of us have quite perfectionist roles and I think that's why we have even more burnout. It's all a life of micro trauma that we couldn't explain mm -hmm. and no one necessarily given us the odd part on the back. Um, and I know that from practitioner health, we are a... Uh, a large, <laughs> uh, a large uh, proportion of the, of their work. So thank you. Uh, so helping everybody would definitely help uh, my 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 pals, shall we yes. say? Viv, if you want, uh, um, Mary, Dr. Mary Doherty has wonderful resources. Uh, so if you want those, drop me an email. I'll, I'll just pop the email into the box here, into the chat box, and um, I can send them on to you. I just thought her talk was so inspiring. Yes, Cindy. Very nice to meet you. I can see now we're down to about nine, and we're probably four or five of them, and it's two o'clock. So I'm wondering <laughs> yeah, if I, that's our cue. We'll get to... off our soap box, soap boxes then. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Though it's been really fascinating discussion, and really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for chairing Jenny as well, and thank okay. you, Megan, and that's me. Thank you.